once people have gotten in. Thank you all for being here for the finale of Tech Talk, a show about technology and the pioneers who make it tick. Um, I am super thrilled today to basically, this is kind of like a combined force. This is like a Voltron of all the things that like I love in the industry right now. So this finale is in partnership with Games for Change as part of their XR talk and play panel series, of which there are three leading up to the big Games for Change Festival, which you'll see uh, over there is July 14th through 16th. It is free, so please register, please come out. We're going to be announcing the lineup soon, and I have to say it's like mind-blowing who's agreed to come out. Um, part of it being virtual, obviously, is we had to change some of the formats, and so we pushed some of the panels that we wanted to have at the festival out into the real world or virtual world as it were like this, which is why you have the good fortune of being able to engage with this panel in VR, which feels super fitting to me because uh, it's about volumetric capture, um, uh, a rapidly evolving important technology in this space. We've got some dancing going on uh, to go along with it. I love it. All the dancing is welcome. Big thumbs up for the dancing. <laughs> um, so with that, I'm gonna send it over to all of you so that I stop talking for a minute. If we could just work our way down just to keep things easy, if y'all could introduce yourselves and particularly give a little bit of background in terms of your experience with Volumetric. Uh, hi Ooh. guys, um, my name is uh, Adam Rogers. I'm a creative producer from Intel Studios. Um, been working at the studio for about uh, 18 months now, two years. And my journey really began by meeting the wonderful team of Diego Paluski and Sarah Vick, um, who are the sort of head team there. Diego is the head of studio. And I got involved in a project called Running, which was with Reggie Watts, where we, we took him and a bunch of dancers and created this amazing uh, sort of retro futuristic dance party, really creating a feeling of inclusiveness and a space where you are basically feeling like you're right there with with Reggie and the dancers having having a dance party. So yeah. Awesome. Wonderful. All right, I'm gonna use my mic. Hi, everybody. <laughs> um, my name is Yasmin Elliott, and I'm a co founder at scatter. We're based in New York. And we are um, a company, a hybrid company that focuses on the, you know, pushing forward on volumetric filmmaking. Um, and we do so in two ways. We make a tool called DevKit, which is um, a accessible software solution for volumetric capture. And we can talk a little bit more about that and how it works. And then uh, we also do our own films, our own original productions. Um, and my role there is I head uh, marketing and our creative R&D team. So I uh, produce or direct our productions in, in pursuit of pushing our tools forward. And uh, you may have seen the project I directed, which is called Zero Days VR, which premiered at Sundance in 2017. It's on um, Office and Steam, um, and it won an Emmy in, I think a year ago, in the original approaches to documentary. Uh, so that's me. Awesome. Hi guys, uh, my name is Laura Risotto. I am a singer, songwriter, recording, performing artist. And uh, I've been exposed to VR and AR um, a few years ago because my brother actually works with the medium. But then I got involved in it more when I first, I wrote a soundtrack for one of his projects, which was a, a VR experience called Where Thoughts Go. And then my experience, my personal direct experience with a uh, volumetric captures that I became one. <laughs> so um, I worked with MetaStage here, Christina um, is the CEO for it. And uh, we created basically a volumetric capture performance of one of my songs called One More Night and another song called Fun Girl. And we were the first ones to release um, a brand new song, a brand new performance. Um, with this technology of volumetric capture. And it's been such an exciting time. I am loving to, you know, be able to learn more about this technology. And I'm so looking forward to hearing from all of the panelists about in other ways we can expand this with our creativity. So that's me. Yeah. Hey everybody. I'm Christina Heller. And as she said, I'm the, the CEO of MetaStage. Um, we're a volumetric Ooh. capture facility in Los Angeles that uses the Microsoft uh, mixed reality capture technology software um, that, you know, I've been working in immersive since uh, the beginning of 2014. So I've definitely been riding the, the wave, the roller coaster of, of this amazing world. And I just think it bears mentioning how cool it is that we're doing this right now in VR uh, at a VR talk show. It just um, so much like this would not have been possible um, 
in 2014. Oh. And she says, like, just as her computer starts glitching. Can you still hear me? <laughs> yeah, you're fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Okay. yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, <laughs> anyway, uh, basically, Volumet, uh, I, I, uh, we launched Metastage in August of 2018. And so now volumetric capture has become my passion and specialty in the space. Um, we've we've done, I think, about maybe 40 or maybe even closer to 50 projects uh, in one way or another over the course of these two years. And um, working with Laura was a real highlight, you know, being able to do a full performance uh, from beginning to end. You really start to see the potential of, you know, bringing the, the magic of a live performance to the masses through this medium. So, yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Yay. Um, hi everyone. I'm I'm David Liu. Um, I, most folks probably know me from my work actually from working at Viacom, where I used to head up the uh, VR team there at called Viacom Mix. Um, our it's so funny. Like I, I know everyone here on on this panel really because I've worked with them in some way or form. Like I met Adam when we were working on Tyler Hurd's music video called Chocolate. You made me, David. Back... <laughs> dude, dude, that was that was a great project. And and Amazing. I've been working in the in the volumetric space in 2017 when we first discovered the Microsoft volumetric capture solution as well as the status solution here in New York City. Um, so you know when I was at I was at Viacom like one of the things you want to do is try to represent all the performers there in as real as possible and that's why volumetric capture was really the best solution we found and hence you know since then we really have been trying to bring it to the masses so to speak. So in 2018 uh, we formed a life ring company and tried to work with all the all the providers to sort of bring it to New York City. Unfortunately, um, Lightframe was a victim of the market and we are no longer operational, but I'm still here to talk about our adventure and our journey, having used it and having used other solutions here in the panel as well. So let's let's get started. Amazing. And, you know, David's also being a little bit modest about his background. Uh, we're all sure that whatever comes next after Lightframe is going to be incredible, volumetric or not. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you, Jesse. I want to set the scene a little bit with everybody who might be kind of like, wait, volumetric, I kind of get it. Um, so as a sort of basic starting point, the way that volumetric works is you're capturing 3D uh, footage, be it photo or video, but in many cases you want it to be video um, of a given subject. And what I want to throw to all of you and just start really broad and kind of work our way into more discrete buckets like performance, like, you know, documentary is what is the power of being able to capture real life in 3D? Because I think a lot of people might say, oh, well, okay, that's cool, but maybe it really only applies to this one little use case. But all of you obviously know that this is a much broader thing. So what are those um, sort of unique superpowers of capturing, you know, people, places, things, um, volumetrically? Well, I'm happy to jump in. And and by the way, can my my yeah. screen is all glitchy, but you can hear me, right? And yes, me, perfectly yes. fine. Yes. Okay, yes. that's great. I'm just going to close my eyes and continue. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, no. So, you know, I think of volumetric video as the next evolution in cinematography and photography. You know, um, it we are now taking, you know, a real performance, but capturing it from every possible angle to create a fully 3D asset. And the goal is to, that it has all the integrity and all the, the nuances and micro expressions um, and authenticity of the real performance. And, and because it's 3D and because you can, you know, look at the performance from any angle, um, appreciate it as if it's happening right in front of you, it's, it's so far, I think, the closest thing to the real thing um, when it comes to you know, replicating somebody's movements and performance. And, um, and I think as you know, we move into spatial computing and immersive technology, obviously, you know, 3D is, is a key part of that. And you know, as we move into these virtual worlds, I've always like asked the question, like, what what are these virtual worlds without real people and real performances in them? So I believe that volumetric is the real person's seat at the virtual table, and and it's how we will bring you know all of the magic of humanity into spatial computing and, and immersive technology. Yeah, I'd like to add on to yes to what Christina and um, you know uh, at Scatter we we kind of uh, think of volumetric as this sort of bigger umbrella of what we call volumetric filmmaking because we all come from 
a documentary and filmmaking and photography background. And so it is the first big problem to solve is the volumetric, you know, capture of human performance, human presence. But for us, it also involves, so how do you also capture the entire world and the context of these performers um, and the world around you? So we see kind of all of this is started, sort of a whole workflow actually under um, volumetric filmmaking with the human performance being the most difficult one to solve first. Um, and I'll say also for, for us, there's something quite special about um, uh, you know, we see there's a, obviously a future we're moving towards that is the, you know, merging, emergence of the, you know, the craft and sensibility of filmmaking with the power of game engines, right, and the interactivity of game engines, and we're all kind of moving to this world where these are colliding, and that's where we see, you know, volumetric capture and volumetric filmmaking really sort of ready and poised for this convergence, and that's the future we're building towards, and that's the exciting thing about all of this. Um, and I'll also say that there's something interesting about what is, uh, what is like the um, you know representation of humans, whether it's uh, photoreal or you know obviously everyone here is, wants to customize how you look. And so, what does that look like in a, that future? Is there a way to have an ownership over your own you know uh, volumetric presence and your avatars um, in this new future? So that's something to think about. Yeah, I, I want to jump in as well. And sort of... Sorry. Whoops. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh no, I was just going to say you know it's, you know from a performance perspective, one of the things that you know with our stage at Intel is it's it's literally the size of a Broadway stage, and you know it's accessibility to certain types of content and performance that you might not normally get the opportunity to have, and versus obviously seeing it on a 2D flat screen, you now get to really see the power of that performance, especially in dance and choreography, um, which is a number of projects that we've done over the last couple of years that really accentuate that and. You know, when you think about opera and other types of arts that may be not so accessible for everybody, this technology is really providing a platform for that, that, that those sides of the arts that may not necessarily get their eyes, um, you know, in, in the real world. So VR with a volumetric just, just creates that world that we, we, we so desire. One of the things that we often get asked is like, what's the difference between volumetric capture and motion capture, right? And like, what are the differences? What are the costs? And one of the big pros that Volcap has of older motion capture is really you're capturing reality. You're not you're not disguising them as an avatar. You're not trying to capture the, both first the likeness and then the performance. You're actually capturing them right then, right there, with all the micro expressions that come with actual performance. And and so like you know we often tell people that you're actually capturing performer as authentically as possible. And that's one thing that's extremely hard to get and extremely expensive to get with other solutions out there. So I just want to throw that out there so that people understand that, you know, like this can work in concert with motion capture, but it's really, really different. And in, in many places it's 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 its own thing and it's really, really much better in a lot of ways, especially like what Adam has said in terms of capturing large arena spaces or something as small as what MetaStage and Scatter are doing with sort of you know capturing very authentic um, people. A small scale. I think um, the cool thing about photometric um, captures, basically, from more from like an audience and um, art, audience and artist kind of relationship. It's just you're able to provide a performance that feels intimate, but is also customizable in some way. I think that that again, like Christina said, it's the closest thing you can really get to a real life performances. And for so many people who have artists they enjoy, they will often not get the chance to actually see the, their favorite artists performing live. So this provides them the opportunity to do that, having the best seat in the house and having, I think, even when you're actually watching an artist perform live, you can't necessarily get all angles. So it's, it's an even more enhanced performances in some ways, which is super unique and cool. Um, and I think it also is it makes the experience more more like a memory between the person that is watching it and also the person that created it. Um, I think that, at least as an artist, to me, my goal is to be able to connect with the people that are watching my work or listening to my work. And this creates a bond that I wasn't able to do before, at least not to this capacity because it's so accessible because of the technology. So I think that's really, really cool. And uh, I can't wait to see really how people will expand with um, how, like depending on how comfortable they're able to get with the technology with time. 
Well, let's pick pick back up right there. Um, and performance has come up a number of times. Um, Laura, we'll start with you because obviously <laughs> you've actually performed and, and sort of had experience doing that. But then I want to speak, you know, broadly from all of your perspectives. So many of you, I mean, all of you have come at it from a creative standpoint. Um, in thinking about what is the power of not only the performance, but then also how it can be shared with the world and socialized and kind of build community. So Laura, first off, what, what was it like recording, like having yourself recorded volumetrically and performing volumetrically? I mean, it was an amazing experience. It definitely was um, a challenge that I enjoyed. So it was challenging in the best way possible because as a performer, again, I'm used to having a stage. There's the front of the stage, there's the back of the stage, and then you're very aware that you're performing this way. So being captured by all of those cameras on a 360 <laughs> degree level was made me very self-aware of my performance. And then because it's a one take thing, um, we did several takes, but you have to get the performance right throughout the entire song. Um, that was definitely a challenge for my stamina and just abilities as a performer. So I really actually enjoyed being challenged in that way. You know, I think that just pushes us to be better. Um, I, it was cool also to be able to create a performance, being aware that people would be able to spin me around and look at it from all angles. So what I, what was most exciting to me about it was how, um, I was challenged to be creative in that sense that I was like, I need to think of when I'm performing this way. And when I look this way, I'm not looking back. I'm looking at someone else's eyes and that kind of sense was super, super cool. Um, but yeah, it was a challenge that I love taking on. And honestly, I feel like being able to record a performance in this medium, just open like a little door in my brain of like, wow, like this is the future. There's so many different possibilities for this. Can you imagine when more people can be a part of it or when you can add other kind of visual effects to it? Um, so I think that the first time I got to do it really got me hooked for the future. So, yeah. Amazing. And what about those of you who have actually had experience kind of recording these captures? Um, talk to me a little bit about what that process is, has been like for you. It's really interesting. Um, you know, we there are there are there are definitely, as Laura alluded to, some differences between you know frame production and volumetric capture, and and it's just so we actually just had an experience recently where um, one of the biggest challenges is you know things anything that has, at least with our system you know, anything that's too thin um, the trouble uh, the the software has trouble recognizing the geometry of, and so we have to. Um, do volumetrically friendly adjustments to hair. You can't have dangling earrings. We no stiletto heels, things like that. And and you'd be surprised at what a challenge that can be with certain talent. We actually had somebody who was really upset when I guess the director hadn't given them the wardrobe guidelines ahead of time and hadn't instructed them some of the the best practices around hair. And um, so she was really upset when we were telling her that she had to, you know, she needed to adjust her hair to to make the capture look better Looking then when there. we told her she had to take <laughs> off her her dangly earrings she took them off and threw them on the ground oh, no. <laughs> oh my god and she said oh, well i gosh. guess you just want me to look terrible then you know and and it was just it was it was it's a challenging situation because um what she doesn't realize is that to to not make those adjustments we're going to make it's going to make her look much much worse and and especially when you're talking about hair and things around the face, you know, every there's you want that to be the cleanest part of the capture, you know. And so, um, so it. But that being said, you know, we also work with, you know, talent that is is extremely amenable, and and will you know, and and there aren't that many limitations. You just have to, you know, adhere to our our, our few wardrobe guidelines. Um, so. I would say actually that's probably our biggest challenge is just taking people who are and used to getting their way and don't understand the concept of of no and 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 letting and then you know on our end we don't want to do um we don't want to put out subpar work so you know it it it, it, it can be an awkward situation <laughs> yeah we have the same we obviously have the same challenges at, at intel studios and I think it's lessons learned, right? You have to be very clear very early on about wardrobe and props because that is a significant part of the workflow in terms of removing and, you know, color grading and, and reconstruction, all of those things. So 
that's been challenging for sure. But I think we've finally got to a place where we've got a system where we've managed to get that nailed down. But the other interesting mm -hmm. thing that I found through the live capture performance is that, you know, when you think about actors and traditional film and TV, that's really the avenue that you sort of start going down when you're kind of looking for talent. But what's become apparent is the most successful types of actors um, for volumetric capture are actually stage performers because, yeah. you know, they never, they never actually have to think about the camera. They have a floor and a space that they, they, they do that. They do their performance on. So that's been really interesting to see the, the difference because we, we found early on on a couple of projects, it was really difficult to get the actors to really get it. Um, but it's been really interesting to see that how, you know, you take that real performance from sort of stage and you get a much, much more successful performance out yeah. of it. Um, but the whole process is actually really enjoyable. I think, you know, in terms of, you know, what it means to shoot and then go through the sort of process afterwards, it's, it's a lot less stressful after the shoot. Obviously the shoot itself is, um, pretty stressful because you've got, you know, over a hundred cameras that you're collaborating together and you've got to make sure that everything is aligned. You know, you've got to do recalibration through the day, but generally from a perspective of experience, I think volumetric capture, so once we get it fully nailed down and we know exactly like mm -hmm. everything is working perfectly it's 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 a really enjoyable way to way mm -hmm. to shoot it really is yeah I, I it's interesting we, the audience oh. actually yeah. sorry <laughs> no go uh, ahead dave just very, very, okay just very, very quickly like just so, so the audience knows like how what, what typical stages are like just for all the solutions microsoft intel and even scatter like it, you you are surrounded by an array of cameras in scatter's case like you're surrounded by one or two cameras and and basically it's 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 you know, you're not really performing to like one thing anymore necessarily. Um, you, you can, and usually you, there is like a marker for the, for the performance performed to one, but it's not, you know, for, for, for the performers themselves, like there is that sort of like, oh, you know, especially if they don't, if, they ha if they're in it for the first time, it's like, where do I look? Where do I go? Um, so it's, so there, there is that climatization process where you have to really introduce them to, 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 a, to what, what is probably a more novel way of, of, of performing. Sorry, I just wanted to get that out there in case it, I wasn't sure. No, that's super helpful. I was just going to um, sort of kind of talk about an other side of, because we work in documentaries, so performance in our case is a, is a little different. And so you're, you're talking about real people who are not performers and not actors. And, right. um, sure. and yes, thank you for clarifying sort of like how, so depth kit is like a, right now it's like a, you know, sensor only or paired with a cinematic camera, um, you know, single camera solution meant to be accessible and off the shelf using off the shelf hardware, but, and we're working on our multi-cam solution, but that's still down the line. But what I wanted to talk about the um, about like performance or something about the history of uh, of scatter and us as artists and why we created this tool that informs why we approach it this way. And I think it's kind of interesting and helpful, which is we're all artists ourselves and the birth of this tool and all our creative tools and why we still do productions as a startup is because we do projects and these tools to achieve our creative vision that with that with tools that don't exist right now. And so part of um, when we talk about what is performance and what is a volumetric capture as artists, we want this to be an artistic tool that is shows a wide array of creative expression. So it's very important that, um, you know, our character, whether it's for a documentary, like, um, you know, we've done a few documentaries and we need to represent this character as they are, um, that we have that ability. But then we also have a documentary where it, part of the creative conceits like Zero Days was to anonymize our character because this is a whistleblower, it's an NSA informant, and we needed to use depth kit to stylize her and use our sort of VFX act like formats um, to create a new sort of anonymous stylized character. And a lot of people sort of play this line, even though a lot of people use depth kit for documentary, there is sometimes a need to either represent a story because artistically it, it warrants, um, you know, from a creative perspective, like vestige, it's about like memory and loss of memory and losing someone you love. And so they created with the depth kit kind of like a fragmented stylized performance and it's all about a real person's story and it's real humans and so i think there's something about when having to work with documentary that um or creative nonfiction, whatever you want to call it that there is an ability to still represent the world but also add your creative flair and creative self-expression in the capture of the real characters and the real people um but still have a way to represent it to sort of achieve your creative vision and i think that that's sort of how we think of it and our approach yeah, absolutely love that idea. And I and Adam, I remember when I visited um, Intel Studios, there was this discussion of the materiality of volumetric. That actually, it's its own material language, in as much as it's also kind of like a a groundbreaking um, medium. And I don't mean this just you know for you, but for for everyone. 
how are you thinking about what that sort of unique quality of volumetric is or can be, whether it's, you know, the, you know, a 17 terabyte per second file all the way down to a point cloud that's meant to sort of evoke a memory. How are you thinking about that sort of 3D representation, that real 3D representation um, of people in the, in the work that you make? It's, um, it's a journey actually, and it's, it's exploration and it's about the project and what the, the needs and, and the fields of the project are. You know, we, we are, we are obviously striving for complete, you know, visual fidelity of the human form, which I think, you know, is great for when we're talking about projects that like are sort of for archival and to give that real strong feeling of your presence in, in a real world. But, you know, when you look at things like Reggie, um, uh, <clears throat> Reggie running, you know, we went the other way. We decided to use this new technology with its new kind of um, sort of, you know, because it's voxels, right? And it's different to what pixels are. It's different. So we've been learning how to use the voxels to create certain types of looks and creativity that, that can that can fit the, the mold of the particular project. So, you know, when I think about music, you can really go far to the kind of like crazy break it apart put it back together world with these voxels you know bring it back and bring it back in that's really exciting but we're you know we've got that balance we're trying to do really arty stuff but then we're also trying to to do really visual fidelity stuff as well i would say that you know we we are lucky in that i think the microsoft software is is excellent at getting visual fidelity uh because we un, you know unlike the intel stage um, you know, we, we actually have a much smaller stage. Our stage is at maximum a 10 foot diameter circle. Sometimes we bring the cameras in even closer. So um, we, we don't have to deal with the complications necessarily of like the football stadium there, but we also don't have the flexibility of the football stadium either. You know, we, if we're doing multiple people and like more than three people in a scene, we have to shoot them individually and things like that. That being said, you know, I feel like our visual fidelity is very strong again, assuming that, you know, our talent is willing to work within the few limited, you know, volumetric, uh, you know, limitations. Um, so then really for us, it's about the performance, right? It's about creating an atmosphere where the talent can feel comfortable, as you were saying, Laura, like in, in what is probably a unique and new situation, you know, being alone on a stage, surrounded by cameras, uh, you can't even see the director. Um, it's almost like performing in your bedroom in that, yeah. you know, in that regard. Um, and so it's about making a place where the talent feels comfortable and then trying to get the absolute best performance from them during the, those takes. Um, and that is, is really a, an art, not a science. And um, we work with the directors and, you know, once in a while, you know, I'll direct if they don't have a, a director. And, and so I've, I've had a lot of firsthand experience directing volumetric, but often they provide us with a director and then our job is to support them. So in that case, you know, we are, we are trying to pre create a place where great creative work can happen. And then the director needs to work with the talent to, to, to for that magic of getting the best performance. Um, and then what is so special is that when it comes, you know, out the other side of the software and we then begin to integrate it, if if the performance was 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 good, um, the volumetric capture will have all of that, as I said, all that magic within it, and it is now immortalized for for generations to come. Um, so I think anything that that is compelling live is compelling in volumetric, and as and we're in some ways waiting for the display tech to catch up to the the capture technology. Um, so I am very much looking forward to things like the AR glasses and also maybe down the line, some holographic display tech that is truly 3D because I know that these performances are beautiful and solid and, and um, will become cherished over time, whether that's like an athlete doing their signature move or someone like Lara performing, you know, her brand new single at this one unique moment in her life, right? You know, she'll never be this age again. She'll never be this again. And we captured her Ooh. doing that single with all the excitement <laughs> and enthusiasm. And now, you know, as the display tech gets better, you know, we'll be able to engage with this in a more realistic fashion over time. Yeah, let's dive a little bit more on that. Um, 
Yasmin, I was really struck um, by what you were saying about zero days where you're, you're having a performer represent something, somebody who's meant to feel like a real character, sort of a composite of different characters. What do you see as the function both of capturing reality, sort of like Christina saying, like the person in the moment at the time, and also the sort of the feeling that volumetric is reality to recreate or to um, reestablish a reality to something that is from a moment past. How do you approach um, that process in your in your creative work? Yeah, I mean, it's it's actually I could even complicate your question a little more. There's <laughs> also, um, you know, we've been like, as I said, like as we're we're artists, we're technologists, we're tool builders, but we're also storytellers. And I think um, as um, artists and storytellers, when we're taking on a new project sort of a project drives like each of our stories drives sort of the creative needs or the technical needs to be to be just like blunt and so like um, with zero days we needed to as I said this way to sort of build this amalgamate character that represented and anonymized a whistleblower because she was not meant to be she's meant to be real and you can kind of see her humanity but she she flickered between a kind of sort of breakdown between a digital and physical world and um, that aesthetic was meant to serve the story but also that aesthetic turned into a sort of Unity plugin that we also uh, sold as part of our tool. It's actually part of the Unity plugin. And, um, you know, that's where Vestige came from and Terminal 3 and all these other people started using this look to achieve completely different creative visions. And that's sort of like um, the dream that everyone's sort of remixing sort of where we start. Um, but we also, part of kind of what we think about Justice, but what is what is reality captured? Like, I think I was hinting at it at the beginning. As we move into this, like, as like, you know, Christina says, where the displays are going to start, uh, basically catching up to, you know, to where volumetric capture is and where um, also just, you know, rendering and people's like, you know, machines and the whatever, like um, all of that stuff, once it catches up, there's something interesting about thinking about, you know, all of us right now are these like avatars and there is definitely a, we're coming to a future where we can ourselves become, uh, you know, volumetric avatars, real our own captures in these spaces. Um, but then if you do want to, you know, represent yourself accurately or if you want to, as I said, stylize yourself somehow, or if you want to hybrid a little bit of, a, of an avatar, um, what does that mean? And like um, we're thinking, we're kind of, I think when we think about reality, we think about reality as in like there's like when you need to document something as is, whether it's for journalism or documentary for a certain purpose, but there's also a reality of self-expression and how you want to translate the world and the story world and I think that's kind of the spectrum we think about and that's what we explore and we try to make the tool flexible enough for for all of for all of the above um, and also just one other last note um, a lot of people come to use death kit as a VFX tool so not even for VR it's like for 2d music videos like rap God M&M's rap God or um, there's a um, uh, some I can share some other examples later, but we have like people who come to it and film filmmakers because like you can use it to you know capture the human that you want the human performance, but then because of like our, our OBG exports whatever you can literally plug play with any of your um, 3D tools and you can recreate M and M in a new way. You can like you know it's almost a translation of the of these real people, and so I'm really excited by this playful approach to volumetric capture and representation of humans. I love that. So I want to I want to throw one question to all of you that builds off of that um, before then opening it up to questions from the crowd. And, and for those of you who are new, the way that works is I'll activate the um, question asking function and you'll see it pop up on your bottom right. If you have a question, go ahead and just hit hand raise. And then when they're done talking, I'll be able to kind of activate you to ask that question. Um, but yeah, I mean, yeah, building on on what you just said. I think one misconception that I know that I even had was I just sort of conflated volumetric as like a tool, like a the the output I would experience in VR. But there's a lot of other ways that these assets can be shared. And I think each of you have experience kind of in that little burgeoning uh, new um, sort of uh, possibilities for deployment. So I'd love if you could, if all of you could sort of ground the audience in what the other possibilities for volumetric capture are in terms of delivering outside of VR headsets? Well, I think, you know, everything in media can be generally delivered volumetric assets. I think if you've been watching sports, for instance, you know, with the NFL, the cameras, you'll, you'll see a replay and, you know, it'll have those crazy camera moves. That's volumetric. You could think about creating, actually, one of the things that, you know, when especially talking to musical artists, you know, you want to do these really cool 
immersive projects, but really number one question is, is can we do a 2D music video as well? Um, but the great thing about the assets is, is that once you shoot it, you can then really just decide how you want to deploy them and you can use every different type of medium you want, depending on the use case or the kind of marketing, whatever it is for the project. I mean, we've been primarily in obviously sports and then we've been doing, um, VR, but, you know, just recently as well, we just done a project called soul of science, which an app is being released where you get to see hands like real, real performance of, uh, elite athletes in it through your through your through your phone you know so there's the phone deployments there's vr there's tv i think it's everything it's just it's getting the technology and the cost down and the efficiencies down because once the efficiencies are there and the cost is down for a lot of you know media it, it's a much more um effective way of shooting because of the versatility that you, you have with it Yeah, I'll say just to go down the line for, for, I guess, the way I think about volumetric capture, at least how at Scatter, our, our approach, so just to speak on Scatter's behalf, which is uh, we're actually platform agnostic. So we just see that this is sort of a the new future of computational photography. This is the future of filmmaking. So like for us, it's like it doesn't matter whether you publish in for film or, or like to, or to music videos or, or XR. Um, and we actually support all, all of the above and more. It's just for us, it's actually agnostic. It is it is a self a tool for self expression. And there's nothing more interesting than the real humans and real people and real stories and the real world. And we need a way to capture that. And you can publish it in whatever format in your discipline that you come from. And I think that's where we come from. And we believe in that. Uh, what gets me the most excited about creating volumetric captures, I mean, there's there's very different aspects to it. One of them is just being able to create performances that I wouldn't be able to perform live because of the technology, right? So being able to explore those tools and, for example, having being my own backup dancer and be able to create like a trio of Loras for a performance or being able <laughs> to move myself around like um, I was discussing some performance ideas with Christina a few months ago. And I was like, well, if the tools, like if there's no limitation to the tools of this, imagine all that we create, we can create. So I think that just, again, it's like opening a door to your creativity that you didn't know was there before. And there's so many different possibilities. I also am interested though, in learning how, how this can be used for not just creating the virtual performances, but also merging with live actual performances and the awesome visuals we can create with that. And on the third aspect, would be from an educational point of view. Um, I can only, I'm my, I have a master's in music and music education. And one of the classes I took there was actually VR in education. Um, so I keep imagining for people who want to learn music, be able to have access to the performances of sometimes maybe um, their idols and be able to watch that up close and be able to learn how they move, how they play their instruments, their read more about their body language in a way that was never done before. It's like, it's like a private lesson from someone who you aspire to be as. So I think that that would be amazing from a musical point of view, from choreography, as you were saying as well, I think that imagine being able to have dance lessons and choreography tutorials with this kind of technology, because um, there are things that you can learn from a, a 2D kind of perspective, but when you're able to get the full spectrum of a volumetric performance for learning Just how- Just imagine if you volumetrically captured the moonwalk by Michael Jackson, right? You know, that kind of thing, you know. Yeah. That'd be awesome, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's amazing. So I, I think I'm excited to see um, those areas expand with the use of volumetric captures. Yeah, and and that was all very well said, Laura. I agree with it. And and I think what was really fun about your deployment and and what we're starting to see with Yadu as well is this idea of like user generated content. Um, you know, allowing your fans to engage with you and create videos with you. Um, Absolutely. And you know, make their own music videos. Um, I think, you know, that's what we're starting to see with, like, for instance, you were able to do it with the Metastage app. And then I feel like us had, uh just took it totally to the next level with Jadu by creating an entire platform around this concept of, of being able to dance and, and play with the volumetric captures of your favorite artists. Um, and then what, what he did is he made it so that you could, that the, through Jadu, it publishes directly to TikTok and an Instagram and it's been a blast to see with just the few the beginning 
programs that they've released on the platform, the, the huge response from fans. I mean, Laura, you saw it too. Like people did such funny, creative, cool stuff I know. With, your, with your hologram. <laughs> um, yeah. So I think that that's another element that we're going to see more of as well is like, how can we take these assets, but also encourage, you know, other people to be creative with them and, um, and they will, honestly, they're informing us about, you know, how they want to use these, this content and these. But if you haven't um, already, check out, if you have an iPhone, check out Jadu. I think Android's coming soon. Um, a lot, what I think they're doing well, and, and not only, like I said, the, the app is so elegant, it, it it's very in smart the way that it deploys to the other social media platforms, but then we're also seeing such creativity <laughs> in the content, uh, the way that, like, they, I think that us at this team have an inherent understanding of the way that their fans might want to play with these assets or engage with them. Um, so they pick very key, key moments of the songs that will um, translate well to user generated content. So anyway, I'm excited about that. And then, um, and I'm also, as I said, very excited about, you know, AR glasses. And Cool. Yeah, I mean, referring off this wonderful crew, like one of the things we did at the Light Frame and even a little bit of Viacom was really experiment with what you can do with the content after you captured it. So one thing to keep in mind, like you're capturing highly realistic photoreal people and with all that data they capture, you can actually train it. So imagine what you can do with virtual beings. And one of the things, one of the prototypes we sort of wanted to really develop on was like, can we can we capture a, a sort of, you know, Elvis look like and then have that character perform um, in different ways that the original performer did not really intend to. So like we're moving away a little bit from authenticity here, but that's what we think the future is. Like when we are able to sort of capture realistic performances and realistic motions and realistic sort of facial movements, um, can we actually replicate it and have um, potentially an autonomous being that can interact with you and perform with you as well? Lots of, you know, weird ethical, you know, sort of quandaries there potentially as well. Definitely um, one thing we have to sort of acknowledge, but um, the, I just wanted to really acknowledge that the buck doesn't really stop at just capturing authentic performances. It is like the representation of the human being, of, a, of an authentic human being, and where you can go from there. Um, one of the things we did build that was really, really interesting and just really, really simple is just capturing someone using the Microsoft Capture solution. And there's a shader that comes with a solution as well, which I'm sure Christina would be very familiar with, which is basically you can, you can track the, the, the head gaze to wherever the person is in the headset. So imagine if you're in a headset, you have a docent sort of speaking to you, their head will actually track to where you're standing, so they're actually talking to you. Now we managed to build something similar where instead of like being in a headset, this person was in a giant TV frame and we had to connect basically to track the head of a person walking by. So if you walk by what you thought at first was a video, suddenly this video like a haunt in a haunted mansion so it would turn its head to look at you, which is always like, you know, we subverted um, what people thought was a bit was a video with like holy crap this is a portrait of someone <laughs> actually talking to me so you know just want to put it out there the volumetric capture really is a new form of capturing someone and then it, there's just still a whole breadth of what you can do after they have been captured something to think about beautiful on that note everybody please join me in a warm round of emojis for these wonderful <laughs> panelists oh oh thank you everyone that is so <laughs> adorable so uh. <laughs> All right, so we have a couple questions already, and I want to be mindful of time. So um, I'm going to go ahead and start those. Uh, Blanche, you are live. Uh, thank you, everyone. So, can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So first, thank you guys to be here. I'm really, really happy to hear the artist here. Uh, I do theater uh, out of the visor. I'm a designer, like a light and set, and I'll be practicing with these Oculus design spaces through four months. Um, I think we have to work together here like a team, like uh, outside in the rehearsal and things, because I understand a lot of people um, enjoy the templates, and that's good. I mean, not everyone is a designer, but in my case, I'm going to be really glad to design something for one performances. You know what I mean? Like, if you're gonna dance, I can work with you here in this space and build the set for your own 
uh, performance. So I'm really excited about it because I'm really new in this. I do theater for 35 years outside and here I just start designing for four months. Uh, and it's really interesting. I mean, the, but, but we have to work with the same sensation like artists with designers together. You know what I mean? So if you need any space, or if you want to work with me, please just be my friend, <laughs> chat with me, and I'll be here, okay? Awesome. Um, collaboration if i may yep. say something about that i think that's also one of the things that i'm super excited about because i think um at least in, in my world of musicians when we talk about things like that in tech it sounds so intimidating in some ways okay. you know you're like oh wait how do i so i really do agree that it's important that the artistic community the tech community who also like we're all we're all like able to learn new things but i think that 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 collaboration is so important so that artists can come with ideas and then just be like, how can we expand? What can we do that has never been done? And I really hope that actually for, for, for someone who went to music school, that they start having classes that talk about this and how you can use these tools really in order to create things. So it stimulates artists to really get outside of the box and work with people who can design these experiences as well. So, yep. Thank you very Thank much, you guys. Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, Blanche. Going now to Christian. Oh, uh, you are live. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hello. Christian Hi. from Romania. <laughs> uh, I entered this uh, in this event uh, five minutes ago, and I don't want I don't know what it's all about, but I love <laughs> this uh, design over here, this digital <laughs> panel. <laughs> people. And I just want to say, like, uh, I start to use Gravity Sketch, and uh, in three days, I come with uh, an idea to recreate my uh, city where I live. And uh, I recreate my city, my buildings in uh, city center in Gravity Sketch. And I think this is uh, an idea for uh, a real world. No, real buildings in a virtual world. Cool. Very cool. <laughs> okay. Thank you for that. What do you think? Yeah, thanks for joining us all the way from Romania. Great to yeah, have you. Yeah, that's super cool. Yeah. Represent. Not really. Thank you for being a part really of us. Thank Romania. you. Yeah. <laughs> Um, all right, I'm going to do one more question. There's a bunch piling up. So what I'm going to do is have one more question live, and then I'm going to detoggle the stage barrier. So everybody come down. We do a big selfie together. And then you can ask them just directly, you know, right? You can just ask them standing right next to them. Um, so going now to Mr. Mule 96, you are live. <laughs> Mr. Mule. Do we lose you, Mr. Mule? Mr. Mule. Oh, no. I think we lost him. All right. Uh -huh. Going instead to Dave. You are live. Dave? Dave. Dave, where you <laughs> Dave. at? Dave. Dave. Um, Okay, well, I don't know if we might be running into an issue then. So how about this? I'm going to go ahead and institute our selfie right now. Um, so let me detoggle the stage for everybody. So come on down, join the panelists. Uh, you will you will sink to their level. Um, yeah. It's a wonderful, <laughs> wonderful selfie time. Don't sink, but don't sink to my level. <laughs> or David. For that come on. <laughs> should we not? Oh. Should we like take us okay. off to Amplify now? Yeah. No, no, you're, you're, you're fine. We, we'll have uh, nice to meet so you. we got we got Raul in the yellow is going to take our photo, and Lauren in Raul. the black sweater right here. So these are your camera lines. I'm going to join you. Here we, and everybody, here. I'm gonna put my send up your favorite you. emojis, wave, oh, do right. whatever feels true. I'm going to lean in. Thumbs up, oh, no. emojis, waves. Is it working? Hey. I don't know. If it's working. We'll see. Is it working? Am I am I clipping? I don't know. <laughs> All right. Emoji. You're emoji. Okay. Cheese. 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 Cheeseburger. Cheese. Cheeseburger. Cheeseburger. Cheeseburgers. Hey, Carlos. Oh, hey, Carlos. <laughs> oh, I just realized I didn't. I forgot to detoggle the 
the audio. So everybody should have their audio back. I've, I've re-granted you your audio. Um, Lauren, did we get? Are we good? Hi, Jesse. Hi, Christina. Thank you, Beautiful. Lauren. Um, thank you all so much for being here, for attending, thanks, and Jesse. especially thank you to all you panelists for being here. This was a ton of fun. Uh, and, thanks, and Jesse. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you, <laughs> thank you everybody. Thank Bye, you. everyone. Bye, everyone. All right. Bye, everybody. Glad I got to hey, see David, you, Carlos. Good seeing you. <laughs>